This is episode 24 of the Immunology Podcast, Autoimmune Disease with Jennifer Gomerman. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Rad. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. Today we have Dr. Jennifer Gomerman from the University of Toronto on the podcast, here to talk about her research on the mechanisms of immune dysregulation and autoimmune disease. We also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in immunology news coming up. But first... Stem Cell Technologies would like to remind you about Immune Regulation News, a free weekly newsletter brought to you by the Stem Cell Science News Program. Covering research on the regulation, suppression, and the modulation of the immune system, Immune Regulation News keeps readers current with the latest news, research, policy, events, and jobs relevant to the immunology community. Subscribe for free at www.immuneregulationnews.com. So how have you been, Brenda? Hey, Jason. I've been quite right. I was just holding on to the floor so I'm not blown away by our own uh, couple of storms. You know, in all these kind of English Channel area, there was a couple of storms. Uh, I think it was Eunice was the light. It was the worst of them on Saturday. And it was quite... quite um, Quite a thing. Friday, Saturday, a lot of really strong wind gusts, uh, trees being, you know, knocked out, roofs being damaged. Uh, people, a lot of people got like severely injured by stuff uh, falling on them while they were, for some reason, biking on the streets. Because, well, it is the Netherlands after all, so you need to be biking somewhere. So it's been interesting. It's been interesting. Is this a uh, common thing for you guys? Not so much. I think there there's a, a kind of windy season every once in a while. But I think also for three storms, one close to the other, I think that is quite uh, un, quite rare. Did you guys lose power? Mm, not in my area. Not really. But we did get uh, all the public transport was shut down, which is quite, uh, quite uh, what was the word, tragic here. Because we actually use independent public transport. Did your subways flood like New York does every time there's a giant storm? <laughs> no, that did not happen. But I think it did flood at one time. It was raining a lot, but I, I don't know because I don't take the subway that much. So you guys don't have swimming pizza rats that come out when the subways flood? No, no. Amsterdam rats, they eat uh, croquettes and bitter ballen. These are uh, our own snacks. So pizza is not, not really a thing here. Ah, uh, well, it sounds like you guys handle natural disasters better than us. Anyways, well, I'm excited because we had a listener message us, which is very exciting. And they had a question. So this is our first listener question. Uh, a listener named Kyle was asking about the immune responses to tattoos and if we knew anything about them, because the UK has recently banned a number of dyes deciding health risks. Now, if you look at the article, which is in The Guardian, um, they were citing risks from cancer and other concerns. So putting that aside and really looking at immunological risks, dyes are a foreign antigen. And so some people, when they go and get a tattoo, are actually allergic to the dye that's injected in them. Ideally, when you inject dye, it kind of goes, you know, right beneath the epidermis into the dermis, where it's kind of in, in the inert layers of cells, in kind of between the cells, and doesn't do anything. But sometimes it can, and sometimes you get an immune response, and your dendritic cells are sitting there, and so you can have immunological reaction to them. Obviously, it gets a little puffy and swollen and red afterwards, because you have a needle poked into you a bunch of times and put some stuff in. The dyes are designed to be chemically inert, but as we've all learned, everyone's HLAs are different, and everyone has a unique and special immune response. And so in some people, you do have an immunological reaction to dyes, and it can cause it to be rejected and have the dyes be chewed up. It can cause... Um, irritation so you have to go and use lasers to get rid of the dye like your laser removal so it'll break it up and thus make a different molecule that doesn't have the same reaction and get cleared out it can be a mess especially for sensitive skinned people so there you go yes dyes can have an immune reaction uh, with tattoos and it is a foreign antigen so things happen was that cause of cancer is cancer because of the immune reaction or because you're having this uh chemicals in your skin i couldn't deep dive um, but it looks like the UK article is really talking about more. Some of these chemicals are known to cause cancer in certain volumes. And so they're concerned mm. that, well, it's technically a carcinogen. And so they don't want to use it. But like, frankly, like they have isopropyl alcohol, disinfecting lotion is being banned because isopropyl alcohol can cause cancer, but 
everything can cause cancer. So I think, <laughs> at least as I read it, it's somewhat of an overreaction because dose makes the poison, as my wife, the mm. toxicologist, will remind people. And so very small amounts of things are not carcinogenic, like very large amounts of things are. But they seem to be saying, well, if in large amounts it causes cancer, it should be banned, which kind of, to me, at least seems silly. Yeah, I guess that there's probably two very different aspects. One, the inflammation that can sensitize you and generate allergies or immune reactions on the skin. And on the other hand is whatever those uh, metals or anything that is part of the dye could potentially cause. But as you said, unless you're having a full body tattoo uh, with, uh, I don't know, some very carcinogenic dyes, probably not going to be as carcinogenic as living under the sun. But well. Uh, why increase the risk? They have isopropyl alcohol on the list, which makes me think it's probably an overreaction. <laughs> All right. Thank you, doctor. Uh, okay. Next uh, next time with Dr. Goldsmith, we can discuss another health issue. Your MD, PhD of uh, reference. Send your interesting question in. More listener comments are always welcome. Well, we must now jump and talk about science and cells. Um, I guess I'll hop in with the one COVID paper of the week. Go ahead. This was just should be pretty quick, though. So this is a paper in Science Translational Medicine that came out the 15th of February called Neutralizing Antibody Responses Elicited by SARS-CoV-2 mRNA Vaccine Vaccination Wane Over Time and Are Boosted by Breakthrough Infection. It is by uh, John P. Evans is the first author and Shan Lu Liu is the last author. So this is a paper that really just does a deep dive into healthcare workers. There's a healthcare worker study where they take, you know, blood from healthcare workers and then look at pseudovirus and the effects and so of the ability for neutralizing antibodies. And it really goes and just puts a nail in the coffin that Omicron, from the get-go, if you've had COVID, if you've had vaccinations, neutralizing antibodies against Omicron variant do not work, essentially. It's all gone. Goodbye bye. If you have an infection from it, though. Um, you have some level of neutralizing antibodies, although it's not great, which really goes to show a couple of things. And so I thought this paper is interesting because of what's not said in it. So they do a good job showing all the important things. Yeah, you lose the neutralizing response. It kind of comes back with recurrent infections. It's not great. But the, the crazy thing is, is if we think about that, we just survived an entire wave of COVID where there was no neutralizing antibodies and people didn't get that sick compared to all the previous waves. And so that's what I thought was really interesting. If you take this and overlay this paper with what we've known from the trenches, as it were, that there's a bunch of people that have had Omicron all over the world. Yeah, the healthcare system that a lot of people go in, but the death rate was outstandingly lower. And the severity of illness was lower and the vaccines really worked on a cellular mini level like we've talked about. What you're left with then is the fact that neutralizing antibodies are really a bonus. If you have neutralizing antibodies to COVID, great. That means you're going to stop transmission, but the cellular immunity the vaccines provide is key and that we can maybe stop worrying about these neutralizing antibody levels all the time because that's not what matters in the end. It helps prevent spread, but in terms of stopping disease severity, which is what we really care about, COVID having serious consequences, the vaccines are just fine and we've kind of really turned the corner. So that's what I really liked about this paper is that really kind of showed that all the good news about Omicron and where we are in the pandemic was in the context of very low neutralizing antibody levels. Well, that's it. It's a very quick paper, not, you know, 55 figures. It's some very good, succinct, succinct figures that really answers the question. Well, thank you for the very concise piece of information, very relevant to uh, today's situation. Um, yeah, I guess we keep saying T cells are holding the fort. And neutralizing antibodies can be a little bit, what's the word, mm, suboptimal measure of protection, which makes sense given the nature of this virus. Um, I, re I remember, I, I have to be admit, I've been a little bit not on top of COVID lately, uh, tired, a bit tired of it, I have to say. Um, but I know there's, there's still this discussion whether, you know, the immunity from um, infection is, is different and uh, whether getting Omicron in this case will give, protect you differently to a booster vaccine. We did cover that a little. And it looks like it looks like it's not, it's probably a, you know, if you can get vaccinated, get boosted, 
then get Omicron naturally, which is my case, which happened to me, and not have very severe disease, like you're sick for a few days, that's a pretty good way to go because Omicron does provide significant immunity once you get it. And the immunity from natural infection on top of vaccination is pretty good. That's a, that's a good thing. Just playing with fire and trying to get COVID a few times to get your instead of the vaccines is a foolish game. But if you already are vaccinated and you get it, yeah, it's not the worst thing in the world. So did you do it on purpose, Jason? <laughs> no, the no, no, but just, you know, you <laughs> go do things in life and you travel for work and then you get COVID. Well, I guess uh, I wouldn't know so far. So some for some miraculously, I have not gotten in yet. So that I'm you still... know of. That I know of. I agree. I agree. That I know of. Well, thanks again for sharing. Uh, let's talk about other things I now know of that I thought were nice to share with you. My paper, my first paper, very close to my interests, uh, called Repertoire Analysis Reveal T-Cell Antigen Receptor Sequence Features That Influence T-Cell Fate. And I really like this. Uh, Nature and Immunology, first author, Caitlin Lagut. Lactuta from uh, the lab of Somia Rai Chaudhuri at Broad Institute. So this paper, I, it's aiming at uh, understanding something that I'm very interested about, which is what is the influence of the specific sequence of a TCR on the development of a particular T cell? And let me just give a little context around this. This is particularly in the in the and in, in the context of conventional T cells versus t regulatory T cells that are generated in the thymus uh, uh, during T cell development. And for long, it has been known that there, have to be, there has to be some kind of characteristics of the T cell receptor and the, sequ and the sequence of the T cell receptor that differentiates these uh, two cell types. Uh, we understand that T-Rex that differentiate in the thymus are recognizing self antigens preferentially, and with a certain intermediate affinity between what are the two extreme conditions that a T cell can find itself during thymo, uh, development in the thymus, which is either not recognizing the MHC that is being presented on by to the cell by by uh, thymic um, um, cells, um, or by having a too strong reaction against self antigen and self MHC, which is uh, eliminated. These cells are eliminated through negative selection. So only T cells that recognize self MHC to some extent and don't recognize don't highly recognize self antigens are allowed to uh, exit the thymus. And within the cells that uh, within these cells, you have cells that recognize self uh, peptides or self antigens to, to a little extent, and those are um, usually are tend to develop into T Rex, so they 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 become activated and become T Rex. And cells that don't recognize self antigen, they are exit the thymus as naive cells. And the question is, what can we find characteristics of these TCRs that are explain these differences. So what they do is um, they they take, so they, they, they focus on mostly bioinformatic analysis of previously existing uh, um, databases. So I think it's also very nice. They take various uh, databases in which you, they find uh, T-cell, uh, the, the, the sequences of the beta chain of TCRs of many T-cells with their corresponding uh, T cell phenotype. And they tried to identify different parts of this TCR and use that to generate an algorithm that will predict whether this cell would, is more likely to be a Treg or a conventional T cell. So they focus on the different components of a, of a, of a, of a T cell receptor uh, or a particular chain that has a a variable of a V segment, a D segment, a J segment, and a very highly variable CDR3 region, which is the one that uh, really provides most of the peptide specific uh, recognition sequence within the TCR. And they examine many, many TCR beta chain sequences from published databases. 
and they aggregate this in what they call a TCR intrinsic regulatory potential. And they are capable of, by identifying characteristics of all of these different segments with, within the TCR, of finding particular characteristics that are associated with T-reg cells and particular characteristics that are not, that are most, most associated with conventional T-cells. And what I thought that was really nice is uh, what they find, which is something that had already been suggested before, but they do it in a very kind of bioinformatic intensive way with using sourcing from uh, many, many sequences and using a fairly unbiased kind of approach. And there are two things that they find that define T, uh, TCR, so TCR beta chains, which are the ones they analyze, associated to T-Rex. On the other hand, is the particular amino acid residues that are find, found within the CDR3 region, this very variable region, are mostly hydrophobic in T-Rex. And, and this is something that when they, they, as they go in the paper, they show that they, they suggest that this is because hydrophobic amino acids have a higher uh, chance of, of, of stronger binding to their peptides, to their, to their uh, ligands, to the, in this case, presented peptide. And by this, this is how T-Rex get this extra, this extra um, kind of this extra affinity towards self-antigens that allow them to uh, be, have the, the right amount of activation during thymal development to become T-Res and not become naive cells. And they really show this by using a lot of databases and accessing a lot of sequences. They generate this model with training, with training databases and then they predict uh, the, in, in, in kind of other databases, use other databases to predict with the algorithm and they find that this in fact has a, a, a very good predictive value for uh, T-reg or versus T-conventional um, identity. So I have to say the paper re goes on a lot of things on how they, they get around doing this, this kind of uh, bioinformatic analysis. And they also evaluate things as, such as the different segments within the TCR, and particularly the, the V segment of the T of TCR beta, which is the one that, that binds, uh, contacts the MHC uh, at conserved sites. So these are also part of what gives t the T cells the, the, the necessary binding to a, an MHC during development. So they also show that this is where some of the residues that also determine differences between conventional T cells and T-Rex are also found. So it's, it's a little bit difficult to explain maybe now that I think about it without looking at all the really, really nice analysis that they do. But I thought it was really cool because one of the big questions when you're, when you're looking into T cell biology and understanding the identity of T cells is what are the kind of intrinsic signals that, get, that T cell be, uh, receives throughout their development that model their um, the, the phenotype. And I think it's really hard to use a TCR, but in this case, they made a really good point into identifying intrinsic TCR related, uh, segments that will affect T cell development. And I think that's also what it was interesting that if they apply this, this scoring towards kind of a T-reg, uh, a T-reg likely, um, sequence, they also find that cells that have a high, higher score within, for example, tumor samples, cells that are in a tumor microenvironment, and they, you find some plasticity, you often find cells that are both, you find the same clone both as a T-reg and as a conventional cell. And they seem to find that cells that have this tendency of, of being both, of, of having both phenotypes represented, have a score higher in this uh, in this uh, score compared with conventional T cells that are only found as conventional T cells and in, in this particular clone. So I think it was a lot of work and very interesting bioinformatic analysis. Um, and uh, I think it was a nice insight into what makes, uh, what are the characteristics of the TCR that makes a T-reg uh, t -rex. So is the hypothesis then that the TCR that the cell just has, right, through BDJ recombination, mm -hmm. be based on its hydrophobicity or hydrophilicity, 
that will then so make it more likely to select some antigens and that is thus predictive of what path it goes down because obviously self-antigen leads to Treg. Right. So I think the idea is that by having more hydrophobic residues, you have a overall stronger binding. So because there's it's very cool because I never thought about the TCR signaling at this level before I have to admit. So the, this one thing is whether the T cell, so you, you have two things that T cell has to do. On the one hand, recognize the MHC to some extent. And this is they show that this is likely to be dependent on the TR to the when it comes to the beta chain to the V segment, which is mostly intact. So you have several different V segments, but then one of those becomes part of the functional TCR. So most of the heavy lifting on that sense is done by the V segment of the beta chain. And then the second part is whether you're recognizing peptides in um in the in in when, when the peptide is in percent self peptide is in percentage, so you cannot have too low or too high binding by the to the MHC to the kind of uh, non to the invariant parts of the MHC. So there's like a really they becomes a really th a threshold or, or or a gap. So and then on top of that, if you have extra binding uh, that provided by hydrophobic. Uh, residues, then you have more likely to make it to the cut of the T-Rex, but not if you have too much, but you, but probably that, that so that, that extra binding makes you a T-Rex. And what also they make the point, which I thought was very interesting is that it also probably makes you less specific. Uh, and this would probably, uh, if this model is correct, then also then would make T-Rex a little bit more promiscuous to which antigens it can bind to, because as you have more hydrophobic and more strong binding uh, TCRs, you might be, um, what's the word, you might be tolerant to a little bit of mismatch uh, in that sense, to a, le to a higher extent than conventional T cells. So I thought that was also a nice food for thought. Very interesting. And anytime you start talking about receptor binding, I get happy. So very, very <laughs> Uh, maybe maybe more modeling they'll be able to even make this something you can just use elsewhere not not in that lab kind of like now rna seq is becoming you know everywhere yeah yeah i i think there's going to be more and more understanding of the specifics of the dcr uh sequence and its uh effect on t cell function in general well speaking of antigens and t cells and that's about as good of a segue as i can get we're going to talk about the microbiome, but really the my, mycobiome, aka fungi in the gut. So this paper's in Cell. It popped out. Let me get you the day, February sixteenth. Mucosal fungi promote gut barrier function and social behavior by a type seventeen immunity. First author is Irina Leonardi. Last author is Ilian D. Ilyev. So I like this paper because it has all the things I care about, which includes the microbiome, other things in the microbiome, aka fungi, cytokines, and the effect of cytokines on murine behavior. So it's got a little gut-brain axis going on. It's got all types of cool stuff. So high level goes into a couple parts. First, it tries to understand the effect of the gut microbiome, because that's the fungal microbiome, on the gut, generally speaking which has been looked at before, but not particularly well. And there's a lot of reasons for this. One of those is it's hard to study. Um, and we don't just have as good of systems. You don't have like, you know, we have systemic antibiotics that wipe out all the bacteria. You have germ-free, which you can have germ-free fungal as well, because they'll, they'll be free of fungus, mice, but it, it gets difficult. So the first part they do is they look at 16S, you know, they look at sequencing, ribosomal sequencing in mice but they look at luminal and mucosal samples from, from the stomach, jejunum, ileum, cecum, and colon of mice. And they find something really interesting to start with. So in the bacteria fraction, generally speaking, where you are has the dominant effect versus luminal versus mucosal. There's differences, right? Like there's, there's concentrations on the mucus versus the lumen and vice versa, but they're kind of related to each other which makes sense. 
the fungal though, the biggest split is luminal versus mucosal, regardless of where you are on the track, which shows you something different is happening. And the other part is the luminal contents are mostly cladosporidium or cladosporium and aspergillus, which are mostly considered to be environmental organisms transiently there. Whereas the mucosal enriched ones are Canada, Sarcomyces, Saccharomycoposis, um, which is similar to humans, which have Canada and Sarcomyces in the mucosal fraction. So that's the first interesting part that shows that the mucosal lumen, when you just do poop sampling or the luminal contents, when you just do poop sampling, is just going to mostly be environmental contaminants. You really have to deep dive and do mucosal sectioning to understand the bugs on the mucus right on the tissue. So that was the first bit. Then they figured out what organisms they are, which weren't surprising and matched what they saw before, but didn't see a lot of variation across parts of the mouse. And then they did some DSS studies with or without antibiotics to see, you know, intestinal inflammation and see the effects on these. And so what they found is that addition of mucosal fungi ameliorated the um, protection against the injury and reduce mortality. And then using a combination of cytokine analysis and then tissue-specific knockouts, they showed this was due to both a combination of IL-22 and IL-17. Now, IL-22 usually is made by IL-C3s in the gut, but they showed that it was not IL-C3 dependent in this case, and instead using RAG mice showed that it was CD4-mediated IL-22 that was driving the production IL-22 from the from these mycoorganisms, aka fungi, while the IL-17 was from the standard Th17 cells. So, not surprising because they're both important in maintaining barrier function. IL-22 also promotes healing, which will help you have productive recovery from DSS. Um, and they did knockouts and showed that if you did background knockout mice with either of these cytokines missing, they had worse disease and you didn't really get much of a benefit from the adding of the fungi in. Although it depended on which cytokine what had the biggest effect. So then going forward, they then wanted to figure out what else was happening. So they showed it was the ILC compartment. They showed the importance of both cytokines, but then they did something really interesting. Um, so they did it with Citrobacter, showed that the infect and Citrobacter, which is a um, affects adherence. So a Citrobacter is this adherent bacteria that causes wasting disease in mice. And so they showed that the IL-17 component, but not the IL-22 component of the effect was important there, which makes sense because DSS is more about wound healing to an extent. And so IL-22 is going to be more important there. In IL-22 knockout mice, the bugs were actually worse when you added them in because they're highly affected by it. So, you know, they showed some protection from both, but it was hard to figure out what on the IL-22 because they're so poorly affected. And then they did worse. So then they did one last thing, which is that um, it's known that gut fungi and gut bacteria affect uh, human behavior. And so one of these is uh, IL-17 is known to have an effect. And they show that basically mice are better socialized and socialized better with others due to the IL-17 pre present from your fungi. And so they did a kind of a specific ASF. So this is um, fungi-free, but with defined bacterial consortium mice. And then they add the fungi in, show that you get the IL-17 bump. With the IL-17 bump, the mice are more social. And that socialization, they try to then link the human disease related to autism and other things. Because there is a there is a thought that autism may be modulated in part by the microbiome. Um, but then there's nothing going on with IL-22. So, so there in the end, you basically have that your fungi produce more cause your, your mucosal adherent fungi in your microbiome induce more IL-22 and IL-17 through CD4 and CDTH17 cells, right? That then goes and makes those cytokines, which promote healing and resistance to injury and alter how you behave.
mind controlling fungi. Yes, well, that's a thing. I mean, there's many supplemental figures in here. Um, it, it is a very typical cell paper, very, very uh, in depth, many panel figure, <laughs> everything. But I recommend people who are into the field deep dive into it. It's pretty good. I found it really fascinating the effect of microbiome, particularly on behavior. Uh, I, I hope that we get a lot more research done on that, on that uh, area. If only we could modify our microbiome in a way. If there's only were companies oh, dedicating only. on that. <laughs> if only, right? Exactly. No, it's a it's a huge lift. It's it's part of what we we look at is trying to understand this better. It's it's non, you know. The problem is it's a super complex system, and so how do you yeah. reliably do it? Which is why it's a fun job. Yeah, yeah. It would be fun if it wasn't hard. Yeah, I guess eventually we'll have probiotics for depression. Don't call them probiotics. Call them live back, live bacterial therapies. Probiotics we are the are the are the are the name in the field that we don't like because uh, if you do like a study on probiotics and what they say is in the bottle, half of them don't have what you say, and the, and like half of that don't even have bugs in them. Okay, let me let me let me take it back. Live, how is it? Live microbial cult? therapeutics. Live microbial therapeutics for depression. That sounds like a business plan. Shh. Yeah, but yeah, no, people. Though, though there are people already doing FMT for it. There's human trials for fecal microbial transplant. It's proof of concept for this. Very interesting. Um, okay, so last uh, paper of the day. Uh, we're moving well. A little bit, uh, we'll bring it up from the intestine to the brain. And I want to talk about a paper about uh, glioblastoma and the effect of the immune microenvironment on T cells in glioblastoma. So T cell dysfunction in the glioblastoma microenvironment is mediated by myeloid cells releasing interleukin-10. Is the title of this Nature Communications paper. First authors, Pidia Rabi, Nicholas Neidert, and Paulina Will from the labs of Oliver Schnell and Dieter Heinland from Freiburg University. Um, and this is also very bioinformatics heavy. So I've been <laughs> looking a lot into their models. It's uh, very interesting. In this, they also a lot of wet labs, so both things. They apply, they kind of try to make a model in silico to understand relationship both uh, kind of spatial relationship between cells in glioblastoma, but also trying to understand cells that are affecting other cells by the kind of cytokines or ligands they produce. Um, and basically, as you said, it's kind of an overview of this paper. They do single cell RNA seq. They do pseudo time analysis. Uh, I'll go into that a little bit later uh, to try to identify different responses that. Uh, are connecting the different cell states that they find from single cell RNA seq, and they um, they identify IL ten signaling as a major driver of exhaustion within T cells found in glioblastoma. It's a human sample, so I think that's also very interesting because often mouse models are really difficult. I think for for this particular tumor. They uh, generate a or they rely on a new type of um, algorithm they call nearest functional connected neighbor in which they, as I say, they try to identify cells that are kind of an effector cell and a receiver cell for a particular um, um, stimuli. And they try to identify cells that are probably interacting with each other from the transcriptomic data. They do also spatial transcriptomics. So they look into RNA expression on slides and uh, they come up with a model and identify particular myeloid cells that seem to be uh, key IL-10 producers. So what do they see? From the single cell analysis, they find they identify clusters of exhausted and effector T cells. They, what they, in general, what they see is that T cells in glioblastoma, they find from eight different patients, they're not very proliferative. Uh, there's a, which kind of, it's in, in, in line with what we know about glioblastoma, uh, which has a very suppressive environment for, for immune cells and doesn't really benefit from checkpoint blockade. Um, 
they find a, a kind of a subset of exhausted cells that are mostly CD8 cells. They don't find they find some exhausted like cells within the CD4 TH17 like compartment, but they focus on the exhausted cells within the CD8 compartment. And by using zero time analysis, they um, generate a kind of a model in which their cells are being uh, are progressive, progressing into an exhausted state together with IL-10 uh, response to IL-10 signaling, and they hypothesize that then there is a uh, IL-10 producing cell that is generating this IL-10 rich environment and affecting tissue function. Um, so they um, they do a lot of kind of interesting bioinformatic analysis. Uh, one thing that I hadn't seen before is what they, they do, what they call a, a in silico perturbation. And they focus on the gene uh, that encodes from BLIMP1, which is part of the uh, the IL-10 signaling axis. So they 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 uh, look into the IL-10 STAT3 BLIMP1 signaling axis, which is, has been associated with T-cell exhaustion. And they make a very kind of an interesting uh, approach is that they... Uh, they model in silico what happens if you deleted a blimp one or so uh, a PR, a PRMD, a PRDM1 is the gene. And they, they show in their model that T cells that this would revert the uh, progression towards exhaustion in the CD8 compartment. And this is how they kind of re suggest that this particular axis is important uh, for the progression of, towards exhaustion of CD8 cells. They do also a very cool kind of uh, spatially uh, tr spatial transcriptomics with the new 10x um, platform, and they identify they identify different tumor subsets, and 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 they, again they look into the the distribution of myeloid cells and T cells, and they start they also see that there is association of T cell exhaustion and particular myeloid subsets, and when they use their algorithm, this uh, nearest functionally connected neighbor algorithm that they use it, I said, to identify cell pairs that are most likely to be related because on the one side, one is expressing a ligand or is releasing something uh, on, the, on the environment that the other side has a uh, receptor towards and it's showing activation downstream of the signaling. And when they combine this with the, with the spatial data, also they look into cells that are physically uh, together they and they focus on the IL-10 signaling, IL-10 signaling particularly. They find myeloid cells, particularly from two macrophage clusters, that are expressing macrophage genes. So they are that's how they use them to identify the cells, and that are connected to the exhausted CD8 cells and TH1 clusters in the CD4s as well. And they find one particular marker, which is the heme oxygenase one HMOX uh, one. Uh, that has, has been associated also with alternative activation of macrophages, so kind of anti-inflammatory macrophages. And they found that these myeloid cells that they identify are in fact expressing uh, high amounts of IL-10. And I think that they do, and it's kind of the last thing I want to mention, is that they use this neocortex, uh, ne human neocortical GVM model, in which they take neocortex from, from patients, and then on top of that, they add uh, T cells from the the actual uh, uh, cancer patients, and they can look into the uh, the interactions between the the, the and, and the activation of the T cells, either in just the, the regular uh, 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 sorry, and they also add on top a, a glioblastoma cell line, uh, sorry pri primary primary culture, and they see how this uh, together with the neocortex, uh, you know, the whole system uh, affects or you know, works together. So it's kind of uh, trying to model what happens in the actual brain. And they can also, by adding clodronate, they can eliminate myeloid cells. So they can also look into, uh, specifically look into the effect of my the myeloid compartment in this, in, this whole, um, in this whole interaction. And then they find, again, that this HMOX1 positive cells are really kind of seem to be uh, dampening the T cell response and either by depleting them or by using IL-10 inhibition, they can reduce this, in this inhibition and activate expression of granzyme B and also IL-2. And they actually use this as for one study case in which they treat a patient with uh, a JAK-1-2 inhibitor 
because it has been because uh, they can um uh, they can um interfere with this pathway using this inhibitor and they actually treated one patient and they showed the results from this a patient that had re had uh, um had had a, a secondary a relapse from for after kind of standard treatment for glioblastoma, and they give this uh, JAK one two inhibitor beforehand, and um, then they they remove the the new tumor, and, and they sh they show that this tumor so it had been it has had had a kind of an activation they show a more activated uh, T cell phenotype a higher proportion of CD eight cells. And they uh, and they suggest that by by inhibiting JAK one two and then that re uh, reduces IL ten release and that actually is linked with activation of T cells. And what is interesting, this patient after this, this resection uh, had apparently was oh, for already two years without a new uh, relapse, which I think was kind of interesting. So I guess they're probably gonna uh, ex ex explore this clinical possibility further. Well, that's super interesting because JAK1-2 inhibitors are potent immunosuppressants used in inflammatory bowel disease. And now yet you're here, it's opposite where it releases or it dampens IL-10 signaling. Yeah. So, so that that's backwards. Did they describe these cells, the myeloid cells, as myeloid-derived suppressor cells at all? Did they use that language or did they beat around the bush and not say they were suppressive myeloid cells, but not MDSCs explicitly? No, they don't. They don't use a specific um, that specific uh, terminology. And also, what is interesting is that when they do the neocortex uh, model, they don't have macrophages in that model. It is almost exclusively um, microglia. So they also show that this is also uh, valid for microglia cells. They also can apparently express IL-10 under these conditions. And it's also microglia that are HMOX1 positive. So this this marker does seem to really correlate with IL-10 production. That's very interesting. All right. Well, normally we would break here and do our next little information on awesome things from stem cell. But I just got breaking news I wanted to share that just popped up as we were talking, which is that Paul Farmer, the famous Harvard uh, professor, epidemiologist, anthropologist, infectious disease warrior, has died at the age of 62 um, in Rwanda suddenly in his sleep. So he's the most, he's the one of the most famous uh, people that's been fighting HIV, COVID. He's one of the biggest uh, worldwide pandemic fighters. And apparently he just passed away as we were filming this. So um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, in where I come from, we always say, may his blessing be a memory, uh, a, a pleasant memory to those who remain. But I think he's one of those people that's really had a, uh, marked impact on the world that will be missed. All right. Well, on that note, um, you got to keep the immunology truck going and fight off all those diseases. So yes, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Jennifer Gomerman at the University of Toronto in just a moment. But before we get to that, explore scientific resources for your immunology research at the Stem Cell Technology Immunology Learning Center. Choose from different research areas and find expert interviews, technical tips, educational webinars, instructional videos, and much more. Visit stemcell.com slash immunology hyphen research. Hi, we're talking today to Dr. Jennifer Gomberman. She's professor at the University of Tor Toronto. And the government lab focuses on mechanisms of immune dysregulation in autoimmune disease, the rise and burden of autoimmune disease in current times, and the role of TNF family members such as PATH and nifotoxin in immune cell biology. More recently, they have also contributed to the study of mucosal immunity against SARS-CoV-2. So we're very excited to talk about uh, any, any of these topics with you. Thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for being here. If I may start, so um, last week, in last, last episode, uh, coincidentally, we discussed a recent paper that caused a lot of, and I uh, got a lot of in interest, uh, in which the, there was found a causal connection between uh, EBV virus infection and uh, the development of MS, and an other paper that actually also found a kind of causal role of B cells in the development of neuroinflammation. And I think this is really kind of right up your alley, and I was hoping you, we could discuss 
your uh, also a fairly recent studies on the role of IgA secreting uh, uh, B cells and the uh, uh, immune uh, immune dysregulation in the CNS. Yeah, sure. Well, we're about to do that for Journal Club in my lab, so I have yet to go through it with a fine tooth comb, but um, it is consistent with other smaller epidemiological studies that preceded this particular paper, showing that it's quite rare to have MS and to not have had EBV. And if I recall, I think there's some earlier studies that have also looked at when a person is first infected with EBV is potentially important as well. So um, this, this result didn't surprise me. I think it's really well done um, in that it's you know super robust. And I liked the fact that they did the control with the non-EBV virus. Um, so it, it seems pretty clear. I mean, the, the big question then is that, you know, most of us have, have had EBV and are latent for EBV. So what does this mean for those of us who don't develop MS? So that will be the hard work uh, ahead. Um, in terms of B cells, I think the fact that um, our best therapy for MS is this anti-CD20 therapeutic, uh, which is a B cell depleting agent, also known as rituximab or ocrelizumab. The fact that these uh, B cell depleting therapies are really the best tool in the neurologist toolbox for treating MS tells us that there's something fundamental about what B cells do in this disease. I'm not convinced we have the full answer to that and um, yeah, happy to explore that further in this particular discussion. For sure, because one of the things that you focused a lot on IgA secreting plasma cells Mm -hmm. But they don't express CD20, do they? Right, they don't. So, so we, we wondered, actually, the reason we did the experiments that we did in mice was based on not just the anti-CD20 results, but the results of a different clinical trial where um, knowing that anti-CD20 does not touch plasma cells, knowing that people who have had a beneficial positive clinical response to anti-CD20 treatment, in other words, their MS is improved and their uh, lesion load in the CNS is decreased. Yet these uh, patients who've responded well to this therapy uh, still have evidence of what are called oligoclonal bands in their cerebral spinal fluid. So that's evidence that there are B cells within the CNS compartment, in particular plasma cells that are actively making antibodies. And I thought it was really interesting that these patients had this remarkable response to therapy, but yet retained their oligoclonal bands. It doesn't mean that they are not unchanged in a level that we, we can't appreciate, but certainly they're still there. And so a subsequent trial looked at the impact of um, targeting both B cells and plasma cells. And it's pretty hard to get rid of plasma cells. In fact, people who have um, multiple myeloma is a cancer of plasma cells, and those are really hard to get rid of. Um, they don't proliferate very much. They tend to hide out in these niches within the bone marrow and in the gut where they access survival factors, and that includes BAF um, as well as APRIL. These are TNF family members that allow these cells to survive over time, and they survive a long time. In humans, IgA plasma cells in the gut can last for decades, um, and that's being shown through carbon labeling experiments. So this um, human clinical trial attempted to get rid of both the B cells and the plasma cells by targeting BAF in April. So in other words, by starving them out. And um, that did work because patients who are on this drug do have a drop in their antibody levels, but these patients got worse in terms of their MS. And the trial was halted because it was clear there was some kind of signal going on. And sure enough, once unblinded, it was the drug that was making them worse and it was making them worse in a dose dependent manner. And so that trial really made us sit up and, and pay attention because we thought, okay, here you've gotten rid of B cells as well as plasma cells. And is there something that we don't understand about these compartments of B cells? Um, they, we don't have the same kinds of ideas of their heterogeneity as we do in the, in the T-cell world, although that's changing. And so we, that's why we decided to dig into that question. 
So diving in clinically, I was really interested in this in your, your paper as well. So um, when you were looking at the IgA binding of fecal bacteria and how that's related to patients in your paper, do you think that's because they're being mobilized? So like the, the, the IgA that you're talking about that can go protect against neuroinflammation, is that being mobilized to the site of active inflammation during a relapse to try to prevent the problems that are happening? Is that kind of where the thoughts are? So maybe supplementing further is good? Mm -hmm. Well, so that work was done by uh, Anne Katrin Prepstel and Sergio Baranzini when Anne Katrin was in uh, UCSF. She now has her own group in uh, University of Basel. And um, yeah, what she was looking at just for to, to fill your audience in was um, she was doing a, an experiment called bug flow. And she was looking at the amount of IgA that's bound to microbes in the fecal material. And um, what she found was that there wasn't a big difference between uh, people living with MS versus healthy controls in terms of how much uh, of that IgA was bound to uh, resident microbes in the intestinal tract. But what was different was that when an MS patient began to flare, when they began to experience a relapse, that amount of IgA on the bacteria decreased. And so we didn't have access to gut biopsies from these patients, but by extension, what we think this, what we think is happening is that these cells are being mobilized, these IgA producing cells are being mobilized out of the gut during these relapses. And uh, Dr. Krebstel went on to show um, with Dr. Berenzini that if you look in MS patients in the cerebral spinal fluid, you can see some matches between the IgA that's in the CSF and the IgA that's in the gut. And these matches appear evident during an active relapse. Now you're asking a deeper question as well. You know, why would we do this? Why would we send potentially anti-inflammatory cells um, out of the gut and you know, into the, the, the CSF and presumably um, into the, the brain itself. Um, that's, a, you know, a question I can't answer. I can only speculate. But, you know, we're taught as immunologists that when, when there's a fire, that there's going to be both the, the arsons who've lit the fire, but there's also going to be the firefighters. And so there's always a, a, a balance in any immune response of both pro-inflammation and anti-inflammation. So one possible interpretation is that this is what happens when you have brain inflammation. There's cells that get sent to the CNS to, um, to control any potential collateral damage. Obviously, we haven't evolved to get MS. We've evolved to, to fight against uh, pathogens that enter the CNS. So um, maybe these IgA plasma cells are thinking, okay, well, they're not thinking, but they're being sent there because of inflammation signals in the CNS in order to quell some of that inflammation. Um, we also know from the work of um, Mena Katworthy and uh, Dorian McGavern in a paper they published, I think last year now in uh, Nature, where they showed that there's a big abundance of IgA producing cells in the brain dura. So this is the top layer of the, uh, the meninges that ensheaths the brain and the, and the spinal cord. And these IgA plasma cells, their IgA can provide some antimicrobial defense. Uh, to the to the host. So if you don't have them there, then you're much, uh, at least in animals, you're much more likely to have a CNS infection invade into the into the brain itself. So this could be a sort of primordial defense mechanism that has some anti-inflammatory properties as well. It's you know we're still in early days of trying to understand that. So just to recapitulate this, because I was very surprised when I when I first understood this. So we have IgA producing plasma cells from the gut being sent up to the CNS, probably found in the dura, around the brain, during at least during flaring uh, of MS, that they are they're secreting this these antibodies mm -hmm. uh, in these patients. And also, I think you mentioned also, you also uh, in your in your publication, you mentioned also express IL-10, which mm -hmm. actually is serving to reduce inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, I found that kind of mind blowing that you have these things going directly from the gut to the brain. And mm -hmm. also, my question also is, 
are these antibodies have any kind of specificity that is related to any uh, kind of neurological antigens? Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking again, I'm sorry that I'm bringing some other people's work in, but these recent publications that we're actually looking at cells that are secreting anti uh, antibodies that are specific against EVB derived proteins that cross uh, react with uh, proteins uh, pre uh, presented on present on uh, cells of the of the of the CNS. Mm -hmm. So, what are these antibodies against, if anything? So they are antimicrobial antibodies, and 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 and, and uh, Kathleen uh, Krebs still was able to show that they don't bind to any of the most common autoantigens that you would find in the CNS. So. Um, and, it, and that kind of fits with some, some mouse work we did where we looked at the consequence of EAE um, in mice that lacked IgA altogether. Those are difficult experiments to do because when you lack IgA, your microbiome is of course dysregulated. So we had to do this in a sort of fancy way where we, we divided a cage of mice in half and half of them got IgA sufficient bone marrow and half of them got IgA deficient bone marrow. And the recipients for these bone marrow engraftments were all B cell deficient. So that was the best we could do to sort of normalize things. And when we did that, there was some differences in EA, but they were quite modest. And that suggests that the IgA antibody itself may not be providing anti-inflammatory effects in the CNS. Now, it's a difficult chicken and egg thing because the IgA itself is also maintaining homeostasis in the host at the level of the gut. Because if you don't have we know from people who are deficient in IgA that they do have some subtle dysbiosis. Um, it's not as it's not as severe as we would expect, um, but there is some. Um, so IgA, and that's what IgA is evolved to do. It binds to microbes, and so if you take that away, that's going to also change things within the gut. So it's a difficult thing to study because you have this chicken and egg problem. Um, do you have a, a different clinical outcome because of a change that's happening in the intestine itself or a response, a hardwired response in the intestine to something that's happening elsewhere in the body? But it's not the first example of cells that move from the gut and leave the gut. There's been multiple other examples now. It's just most people have focused on T cells rather than, rather than B cells. So if it's not the IgA, itself right which makes sense like what the heck is a microbe iga doing in the brain which should have no microbes in it generally speaking right put aside jc virus and a few things um what do you think it's doing there that's so protective is it a signaling effect and so mobilized plasma cells are doing non-antibody things which we've, we've had guests on who've talked about that and so it's that type of effect that's driving it maybe mm -hmm. Well, okay, so first I'd like to push back a little bit in that um, I think the work that's coming out of Mana Clotworthy's lab, um, and she worked on this with Dory McGavern, would suggest that these cells are forming a barrier in the CNS within the dura. And because of the uh, fenestrated nature of the vasculature in the dura, it is a, it is a point of, of um, it is a bit of an Achilles heel for our bodies. And so we do need to protect that barrier. And IgA plasma cells are really good at protecting barriers. That's why we find them at barrier sites. So it, during homeostasis in, a, in an animal that's, or a person that's not um, experiencing a, a, an infection, they're there as potentially as sentinels. Um, and that IgA may, although low affinity, may provide some form of a barrier. And in fact, what they found in the, in, uh, the Clotworthy paper was that these cells appear to be essential in preventing an opportunistic fungal infection. So even though the IgAs were specific for gut microbes, they could still form this sort of barrier against invasion by um, a fungal species. So, I, I mean, I think there could be some activities of IgA that we don't quite understand. And Emma Slack's talked about this too, about this sort of, um, bacterial enchainment that IgA can achieve. So that's not really my area, but I, I like that idea. I think that teleologically makes a lot of sense. 
But yes, plasma cells, they're, they're multitaskers, so they can do more than just make IgA. And, and uh, Simon Filetro and others have really pioneered this area of research. And in fact, BLIMP1 is, is a cardinal transcription factor that's expressed by plasma cells, and it um, can act on IL, the IL-10 locus. And the IL-10 locus is actually in a chromatin um, configuration, it's quite open in, in a plasma cell. So, um, you know, I think we have to keep that in mind as well. Their, their day job is to make antibodies, but, you know, they seem to have this sort of, these other functions. Um, that brings me back to the idea of the firefighters and the arsons. You know, you kind of need to balance things or else the immune response is so incredibly potent that we would just explode without any kind of checks and balances on it. If, if you allow me to pivot a little bit, Uh, yeah. I'm stick to the IgA, uh, no, no offense to the plasma cells themselves, but uh, your expertise in mucosal uh, immunity has also, or in the production of IgA and the cells have also been very valuable for a different type of disease. And I know that your lab has done also some research on the production of IgA in saliva and the, in, in, the, in the context of COVID. Uh, maybe would you like to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So when uh, COVID first um, became a thing, we realized that um, our work in IgA in response to enteric viruses like rotavirus would allow us to ask some questions about the IgA response induced by SARS-CoV-2. Of course, it's a respiratory virus and, it, you know, It, it will induce a mucosal immune response because of the uh, location in which it infects the body. And, and shortly after, um, pretty early on in the pandemic, uh, there were some papers published around IgA. Um, I know that uh, Dr. Newsom's wife showed that IgA was very good at, at uh, when, you, when, you, when you kind of stack it up against other antibodies, because it's a dimer, it's quite good at neutralizing SARS-CoV-2. Um, and then there was a paper that came out showing that uh, ACE2 receptor was actually highly present on salivary glands and salivary glands themselves could be a, a really big repository for IgA plasma cells. And so we were curious about whether there could be uh, a local population of IgA producing plasma cells in response to SARS-CoV-2 infection. And so we, we published a study on that where uh, we measured antibodies in the saliva and they were first of all found to be there and they correlated quite well with the antibody levels in the serum. But that still left us with the question and we did see an IgA response in the saliva, but it left us with an open question of whether those were actually being locally produced or was this as a consequence of the virus going systemic or something else. Um, so in more recent work, we've developed an assay to look at um, something called the secretory component, which is a protein that binds to both IgA and IgM. And if, it's, um, if IgA is bound to the secretory component or IgM, this means that it was made locally. So it means there was a plasma cell sitting on the other side of that epithelium that made an IgA or an IgM molecule that was transported through the epithelium into that luminal space, whether that be the oral cavity, the gut, Uh, the vaginal cavity, whatever, across the mucosal surface, uh, or, or lactating lungs across um, mammary glands. So uh, we, we looked for that and we found it. So it meant that the IgA was being produced locally and it correlated really nicely with IgA levels, much more than IgM levels. But then when vaccines started to be distributed, we decided we would take these assays and now apply them to people who were vaccinated uh, with mRNA. And in collaboration with Michael Tal and Herb Weissman, we also looked at some of the vaccines that are more commonly used in the United States, like J&J. &J. And then in Canada, we looked at mRNA and AstraZeneca. Um, we also looked at different dosing intervals because in Canada, we had a delayed dosing uh, strategy. And what we found to our surprise, we were expecting to only see IgG in the saliva because IgG can get there through The gingival crubicular fluids. In other words, you get this sort of pressure through osmosis and IgG can enter into the oral cavity uh, through transudation. And this can help protect us against infections. Even though the vaccines were really designed to protect us against disease and they make really good kick-ass cellular immunity to do that, these antibody levels are high enough, at least initially after a shot, 
that you get some in the, in the oral cavity through transudation. But what surprised us is that not only did we see IgG in the saliva, we also saw IgA. And that IgA was bound to secretory component. Now it was, it was low. It wasn't as nearly as high as what you would get with a SARS-CoV-2 infection. So if we compare with a COVID-19 convalescent control group, it was lower. But it was there and it was there in almost everybody after the first dose of the vaccine. And then it tapered off in most people, although there was always about a third of our cohort which would remain positive. Okay, so that's interesting. We don't know how that works and we're, we're obviously gonna work on that in using animal models. But what I think really has set us on fire in our lab is that when we started looking at people who had experienced breakthrough infections, now this is mostly alpha and delta, um, as well as an outbreak in Toronto of gamma. If we happen to have samples from those people from prior, right after their second vaccination, we can ask whether these antibodies matter. And so what we found was that if we looked, and unfortunately we only had serum samples from a, a couple of outbreak situations, one in Toronto and one a big healthcare worker cohort in, in Tel Aviv. What we found was that the antibody levels induced by two doses of mRNA vaccine, if, if you look at IgG, it was not predictive of whether someone got a breakthrough or not. So the people who got breakthroughs versus those who didn't had had similar levels of IgG if you go backwards in time after their second dose. But IgA was. And so if you look at the people who had had breakthroughs, if you go backwards in time, they had significantly lower levels of IgA induced by vaccination. Do you think that's why there's so much debate right now about if natural immunity or vaccinated immunity is more durable? Put aside like the safety risks of getting exposed to COVID, but like there's also, aside from obviously that's a bad idea, but there's all this like, oh, does the vaccine or infection protect more? Well, it sounds like infection has a more homogeneous response in terms of IgA, which is good for protecting breakthrough infections and the vaccine is more heterogeneous. And so I'm wondering if with our clinical trials and everyone studying different things, if that's part of where the difficulty in that noise and trying to understand that is, is this heterogeneous IgA. Yes, it is very heterogeneous. And after infection, it does not persist, right? So a person who's had an infection, um, we'll make an IgA response, we, it's what we published, but it declines much more quickly than the IgG response. Now, I don't know what that means. Is it that the plasma cells don't persist or do they migrate somewhere else? And are we looking in the wrong fluid? Should we be looking in the poop for IgA against SARS-CoV-2? Um, that would be cool. We should probably do that. But in any case, they don't persist at the oral cavity, which is where you would experience a breakthrough infection. So, um, I, you know, it's really hard to say whether um, mucosal immunity due to infection is, certainly it's, it's better inducing for inducing a mucosal immune response than, than a vaccination. No one would argue with that. But in, in terms of the longevity of the immune response, um, I think what we know from mRNA vaccinations is that there is a very persistent memory B cell and memory T cell response that's induced by these vaccines. The ability to lay down systemic memory with these vaccines is breathtaking. And it's not just strong, durable immunity, it's also flexible immunity. The memory B cell compartment appears to be broad enough in order to even respond with a third dose to Omicron, a very, very different variant. But the antibody response, of course, declines. Does it decline more steeply than um, the infection-induced response? Um, I don't know if the IgA is being compared side by side in using the same assay longitudinally over time to, to determine which comes down faster, the IgA response due to vaccination or due to infection. I, I mean, I'd lay odds that it's, you know, vaccination is not gonna produce as persistent an IgA response as infection, based on my knowledge of the mucosal immune system. If I can just add, but I think the more important point of our observation is, is not that vaccination is better or worse than infection. The main point is that our next move for vaccines needs to make sure that we are inducing an IgA response and a good 
IgA response that's robust and long-lived. Intramuscular vaccines are not going to deliver on that. They've delivered on amazing things, protection against disease, but they're not gonna be able to deliver on, you know, in everyone getting good high levels of IgA uh, that last. So I take you're a fan of nasal vaccines? I'm a fan of nasal boosts. It's a really important distinction because what we're learning is that, for example, in Omicron, people who are getting Omicron breakthrough infections who have been previously vaccinated are building on that prior immunity. People are getting Omicron infections who have never been exposed or vaccinated are not making a very good immune response. Maybe that's to do with the tissue tropism of the virus, I don't know. But what that tells us is that if we, if we build immunity starting with the systemic immune response by vaccinating through the parenteral route and then come in and train that immunity to go to the mucosa, that I think is the way we should go. I would lay money on that if I had money to lay down. <laughs> So speaking of money to lay down, um, you were you were previously in industry. Can you talk about that a bit? But you spent some time at Biogen and then came back to academia and what that was like. Because I know even even when I jump ship, they're like, oh, you can never go back to academia. That's just not possible. And yet I've known several people who have. So obviously you can, mm -hmm. but tell me more. Okay. Well, first of all, I was at Biogen from 2000 to 2003, and it was a fantastically fun time to be there. Like that was when different TNF family members were being cloned. Um, you know, the human genome had just come out. It was just, it was just a, a, a heady time. And um, in terms of my field, a lot of the stuff around laying down the organization of immune responses through TNF family members and chemokine expression was just really taking off with some beautiful work from you know, Jason's sister and others. Um, so, so I had a terrific time at Biogen. We had a lot of academic collaborations. My mentor at Biogen, Dr. Jeff Browning, was just my dream mentor. He was amazing and um, he got along really well. We still collaborate now. So it was all good. The reason we left, I left Biogen was really personal. I wanted to come back to Canada and a job opportunity came up at U of T and industry was not nearly as well developed in Canada or in Toronto as it is in Boston or the Bay Area, for example. So I didn't see, having had this wonderful experience at Biogen, I, I felt like I, I wanted to now go back to academia because I didn't see a, a, a parallel for me back in Toronto and, and we were really moving for the purposes of personal reasons and geography. So I would have probably stayed at Biogen if, um, if we hadn't moved home for personal reasons. Um, now, your other question was how difficult was it to transition? So I think that's very personal, like it depends on your, your circumstances. Um, if, you've, if you've been able to publish in, in, well, you have to have been able to publish in, in pharma if you're gonna move back to academia. So you have to be maintained an academic record. Um, but you're not prepared the same way in industry. Like you're not, you're not gonna go to your boss and say, hey, I'm thinking of leaving. Um, I'm on, I'm a full-time scientist at this company and I'm just toying around with maybe ditching you guys and moving on to academia. Like it doesn't work that way, right? And whereas when you're a postdoc, it's expected that you're going to leave. So that became a little tricky. And so I didn't get to really practice a job talk or anything like that, or practice writing grants, which I have to say, not all postdocs get that training either. But I think if you're in a good lab, you should be getting that training. So I didn't have that, um, but you know, I picked it up, I guess. <laughs> On the other hand, I had other really transferable skills from industry. Like I think some of the team building skills you learn and, and some of the um, communication skills are invaluable. And um, I think I learned them really well in industry because there's always a lot at stake. Um, so, I can see the advantages of either trajectory. I wish that the wall between academia and pharma were thinner and um, more productive. And, you know, it really depends on the company as well, too, like how they choose to do things. So I guess the next little step here, we always like to ask fun questions here at the end of the podcast. All right. So why don't I ask one, Brenda, and then you can go for another one. 
because we we got sure. a couple here. So first off, if you were not a scientist, what would you be? So I actually answered this question on Twitter recently, which is why I chose it as one of the questions because I, I knew what to say. Um, so I would probably be whatever else fell in my path first. I, I know that's a bit of a um, cagey answer, but when I was in an undergraduate uh, at the University of Toronto, I should mention to you for your audience, uh, Canadian universities, you tend to specialize more early than you would in a US university, especially US liberal arts college. In Canada, you, you know, by the time I graduated in my fourth year at, I guess you would call it senior year at U of T, I'd ha already had um, one, two, three, four, four immunology courses plus a lab experience in immunology. So that's a lot of immunology. But before I chose immunology, which happened in my third year, I was taking all sorts of things. I was taking, I was a microbiology major and I switched out of that to immunology when I had my epiphany that immunology was the best subject in the world. Um, I was taking French literature because I speak French. I was taking uh, Celtic studies. <laughs> I was doing all sorts of different things because it just was all interesting. And it was just a matter of what was gonna catch my imagination the most. So I think I would probably be an academic, just in a different subject, uh, just in whatever caught me first. It just happened that immunology caught me first in third year and there was no turning back. Well, isn't that a, a lucky uh, su uh, succession of events for immunology? We're all glad <laughs> that immunology fell, fell to your lab first. Um, so from my side, I would like to ask you, what is the best piece of advice that you have ever been given? It could be professional or not. Best piece of advice is, uh, for, and I think this goes for professional and for personal, is to, I think, really stay on top of your mental health, that whatever career you're in, it's a, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. You're gonna have periods of drought, you're gonna have periods of success. And I think that um, during that marathon, you really just have to be consciously aware of where you're at in your head and in your physical health as well. So I think it's important to cultivate some outlets. Um, I find that in my academic life, I'm I'm more successful when I have two hats to wear. I don't know why, that's just the way I'm wired. And so I've always had an administrative role since the past 10 years. Um, and that allows me to maybe, I think I would otherwise be fairly obsessive with my students and, and my trainees. And this allows me to maybe take a little bit of space, which I'm sure they appreciate, um, and sort of you know look at things in a little more balanced way. because. When you're in academia or in industry, you're around really smart people all the time. And that can really shift the way you view your world. And I, I don't think it's always healthy. So having some other outlets to ensure that you've got a, a rich social life, a, a contemplative life is important for me, maybe not for everyone. Um, physical activity and, and you know just really people you can talk to and make you feel good. I know that just sounds very motherhood and and not that you know stunning, but to me that's probably what's gonna help you play the long game. I, it feels like a good piece of advice to me. Yeah, and I think also um, we're we're more we're more than just our data, right? Data is great when it's flowing, but really I think we sometimes lose track of the fact that science is an enterprise of people and data. Without the, without the people, you don't have the data. So you can, you can really derive a lot of satisfaction around training the next generation of scientists, building a strong team, and enjoying their company. Amen. Yeah, I, I agree there. Um, and, you know, people matter. And then the people making the data, the, the making the data are people, right? It's not just like a robot. Mm -hmm. You haven't been replaced yet, folks. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jennifer, thank you so much for this for this talk. It's been super interesting. And thanks for your uh, advice as well for us and our listeners. And we are looking forward to see your next piece of research. Thanks for having me. 
So this is the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Immunopodcast or via email at info at immunologypodcast.com with feedback or if you want, you can suggest a guest. See you next time.